flying bomb over London. For 80 days, beginning 16th June, British defenses faced an average of 100 robots a day. Out of the 8,000 bombs launched by the Nazis, 2,300 reached targets within Britain. Thousands of the buzz bombs, flying at 350 to 400 miles per hour, were brought down by the combination of fast fighter planes, barrage balloons, and anti-aircraft guns. November 1943, air reconnaissance revealed a hundred launching sites stretching from Calais to Cherbourg. Extensive bombings destroyed the elaborate emplacements. The Nazis hastily constructed new firing points, simplified but thoroughly camouflaged. Trees draped with netting and portable evergreens were among the evidence of deception found at a wrecked robot launching station about 10 miles north of Rouen. On a concrete blockhouse, possibly for storing bombs, was a map of the British Isles. The floors of many of the structures were fitted with rails. Apparently the Germans employed this rail line to speed the movement of the flying bombs from storage points to the launching ways. The catapult arrangement indicated the employment of rockets electrically fired. From here, the buzz bombs were sent as far as 250 to 300 miles. Component parts of the launching platforms were still intact, despite obvious enemy attempts to destroy as much as possible before fleeing the area. These parts were identified as possibly being fins for the bombs. The light alloy nose caps and braces when mounted, the nose contained the compass. Broken sections of the flying bomb were scattered throughout the area. About a mile away, a church steeple was used for observation and flight control. Almost all the sites in France were oriented in the direction of London. A number of duds fell in fields the result of improper launching or faulty manufacture. A warhead which contained approximately 2,000 pounds of explosive. Compressed air inside spherical bottles kept the gyros spinning and substituted for a fuel pump, forcing gasoline into the jet engine. A tubular jet propulsion unit was mounted above the tail. The buzz bomb had to be fully regulated before the takeoff. With the mounting Allied victories along the Channel Coast has come a gradual dwindling of the flying bomb attacks. However, there is no immediate guarantee that the menace has been fully eliminated. French artillery pounds Toulon prior to the fall of the naval base, 26th August. Heavy naval and aerial bombardment had softened the port area. In the harbor lies the remains of the French fleet. The ships were scuttled by their crews on November 27, 1942, when the Germans descended on Toulon after Allied invasion of North Africa. Toulon was the scene of fanatical Nazi resistance. The giant French battleship Dunkirk. French port engineers report that much of the fleet must be considered a total loss. 27 miles west is Marseille, second city and greatest port of France, which fell on D plus eight. Poilus battle their way into Marseille against light resistance. Infantrymen attack Germans entrenched in Notre Dame de la Garde, a famous old church above the city. It's one of the siege locations that held out after the fall of the city had been officially announced. Hostilities having ceased, a French priest greets the Poilus outside the Basilica. Wreckage following the cleanup of last-ditch defenders. 
On the night of 27th August, the Nazis surrendered Fort St. Nicholas. Troops of a French division took this strong point in the port district. Victory Parade, 29th August. Crowds cheer the French troops and their commander, General Jean de Latre de Tassigny. Flying fortresses of the 15th Air Force arrive at a Bucharest airport to evacuate more than a thousand repatriated U.S. flyers. These airmen, mostly Americans, were released by the Romanian government immediately after the country's capitulation to the Russians, 23rd August. More than 3,000 Allied airmen were downed in Romania in 13 months of raids. Two-thirds had been killed in combat. Members of the B-17 crews say goodbye to Russian soldiers who had occupied the airport. Thirty-eight planes transported the evacuees. Flyers take with them memories of many air battles to knock out Hitler's former oil sources at Ploiesc. Enemy flak over Ploiesc was considered by the men as the heaviest in the world. Arriving at an Italian air base. Recounting experiences, one of which was the attack of 11th August, when men flew less than 200 feet above their target. Canadian First Army forces on the extreme left flank of the 200-mile-long Allied line in France pushed toward the medieval city of Rouen to establish a bridgehead across the Seine. Entering Rouen, 31st August. Capture of the city eliminated Rouen as a takeoff area for robot bombs. Allied air raids took a heavy toll of enemy equipment, heightening the immobility of retreating Nazi columns. On 1st September, the Canadians continue their advance, taking Dieppe, scene of the bloody test raid of August 19, 1942, and one-time symbol of Germany's strength along the Atlantic Wall. First to enter Dieppe were battalions of the same Canadian division that stormed the beaches in 42, supported by British commandos and small units of American Rangers and French. A cemetery on a hill behind Dieppe, where more than 800 Canadians killed on the 19th August raid are buried. Part of the Atlantic Wall just south of the Seine, abandoned by the Germans as the Canadian First Army rolled the Nazis back along the French Channel coast. Defending enemy forces retreated without a fight leaving an array of useless obstacles and fortifications, once characterized by Nazi propagandists as invasion proof. Buildings along the beaches were transformed into strong points by concreting doors and windows facing the sea. Camouflaged pillboxes given the aspect of beach cottages. Designed to draw fire away from actual strong points, a beach house is camouflaged to look like a pillbox. A wooden gun adds to the deception. More anti-invasion defenses further along the coast. A range board gives sketches of houses, beach details, and distances covered by guns. Still another point along the Atlantic Wall taken by the Canadian Army. These fortifications were seized from the rear as the Canadians advanced to the mouth of the Seine across the bay from La Havre.
Rocket-firing Typhoon fighter bombers filmed by the RAF helped clear the roads ahead for the British Second Army. Eight of these rocket bombs can be carried on guide rails fitted to the wings of the Typhoon. When launched, they add their velocity to that of the airplane, which dives at 470 miles per hour. rocket strikes the target with much greater velocity than is possible for a light bomb released at low altitude. Use of rockets for strafing helps eliminate the long straight dive. It's the predictable dive which sometimes makes the fighter bomber an easy target for flak. Thunderbolts of the 9th Air Force have employed rocket bombs since 17th July. They proved effective in the breakthrough at Saint Lô, which allowed the Allies to sweep through France toward Germany. P 47 rockets can be released either singly or in salvo. have been most effective in attacks on armored columns moving along highways, but have also been used successfully against airfields and in support of infantry. Wreckage on a road in the Ligier area, 24th August, after Royal Air Force typhoons had frozen and blasted a Nazi armored column. Merciless air attacks on Nazi ground forces completely disorganized German transport and supply, paved the way for Allied encirclement and capture of large numbers of enemy troops. Smashed Panther tanks. Their 75 millimeter guns were no protection against the typhoons. Nazi transport shortages revealed by a camouflage horse-drawn cart. anti-aircraft fire of these multiple guns was ineffective against rocket dive bombing. While the Canadians are operating to its left, the British Second Army advances toward Amiens, one of the main German highway and railroad centers northwest of Paris on the road to Belgium.
troops enter Amiens 31st August after an advance of 60 miles in two days. Brussels, capital of Belgium, falls to the British Second Army 4th September, 10 days after the liberation of Paris. Armored columns that captured the city pushed toward the Netherlands frontier in speedy drives to end the Battle of Belgium. salvaging books from the burning Palais de Justice. Retreating Nazis set fire to the building. In the liberated city of Antwerp, German prisoners are driven to an internment camp. Interned at the local zoo, a Nazi officer looks out upon a liberated city from a lion's cage. planes destroyed this Nazi convoy as the American First Army continued the rapid advance northeast of Paris. A task force of an armored division advancing toward Marl encounters Nazi tanks. East of Soissons, 31st August, a German evacuation train is intercepted at a highway crossing and destroyed in a battle with American tanks. Accompanying the Nazis even in defeat and desperate withdrawal were accommodations for women companions, together with carloads of liquor and perfume. Four of the train's 23 cars carried Panther tanks. German tank crews manned their turret guns until they were knocked out. In Paris, a rifle range at the Ministry of Aviation had been used as torture chamber by the Gestapo. The posts where victims were executed are mute evidence of the activity of the Nazi squads. Some of the posts were broken in two by the dum-dum bullets. Before execution, Frenchmen were exposed to flames to get them to talk. Hand prints of frantic sufferers cover walls lined with soundproofing material for stifling screams. Lower down on the wall are prints of young children burned to force information from their parents. Wooden coffins lay waiting for new victims. Other coffins have been dug up as evidence of Nazi torture methods. Engineers under fire ferry a light artillery piece across the Seine at Montereau, captured 24th August. An infantry regiment, elements of which made an assault boat crossing the night before, furnishes crossfire support from both banks of the river. The Nazis are still entrenched at surrounding points. 
gun is ashore, but covering fire continues. of this action was cut short when the cameras were wrecked by shrapnel. Armored patrols continue the thrust eastward on the extreme right flank of the Allied line. They reach a point 130 miles from the German frontier with the occupation of Troyes, important highway and railroad center. This also places General Patton's army 37 miles west of the upper Marne River. A single American medium tank ambushed and destroyed a German motor convoy on a street inside Troyes. American troops put Nazi guns out of commission. It's a precaution against recovery of lost equipment by Germans who might possibly infiltrate behind an armored thrust. Thermite grenades are used to destroy barrels and breaches of the weapons. capture of Reims, 30th August. The famous cathedral city was taken with only small-scale opposition. The main force of Nazis fled in panic and the city is quiet as the first Americans enter. The civilian population of Reims burns copies of Mein Kampf. Verdun, historic battlefield of World War I, under night attack by German heavy bombers. The cathedral is in flames after a direct hit. Verdun was entered on 31st August by 3rd Army troops moving eastward following the fall of Reims. Crossing the Meuse River in the drive toward the German line. 